Yep, so hello everyone. I'll talk about, um, I'm talking about channel language and the finding I'm gonna present to you today is that hearing words in isolation helps babies learn words. And as you can see on the bottom, this is the published paper, got published in 19, uh, sorry, 2019 and Robin Linda Fisher was an undergraduate when he came up with the idea. Up, uh, right, no, it's not moving. Why is it not moving? You have to... Really? You have to watch. No, it works. Thank you. Okay, so what we'll start with is an exercise for you. This is the lead-in task. You have it in the lead-in materials. And we're gonna give you the experience, more or less, of being a baby, hearing a language they don't know for the first time. Now, every baby hears a language they don't know for the first time because they don't know any language when they are born. And unlike you, they also don't know that speech is used for communication, that it's made up of words or anything like that. So you've got an advantage. You're now competing against babies. We'll see if you can do what they can do. Um, so babies are reportedly very, very good at segmenting words out of running speech, which means they hear uh, running speech, but they can locate bits in the speech that are words. So you're now gonna do the same thing here. Um, and we'll see whether you recognize word forms in a language that I hope none of you speak, which is Hebrew. So you're gonna listen to about a minute of dinner conversation between my children and myself many, many years ago, and just have a piece of paper and a pen with you, or a piece of laptop. <laughs> Write down anything you think might be a word in Hebrew. So you're looking for syllables, individual syllables or com combinations of syllables that might be words. I'll play the whole thing, then we'll see what people come up with as candidates of words, and then we'll see why they, these things stood, up, stood out for you over other things or more than other things, and we'll listen again and see if, so, see if we can get other words out of it or, and also allow people who didn't notice these things to notice them. So hopefully this will work. Right. That's all. We will learn the word that's awesome. אם הוא חייב ללכת למאסטרקלאס. אמא, את כבר מאוחר מדי. לא, כי היא הלכה. רגע, 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 אנחנו באמצע פה. עמית אמר לאמיס פדברי שהוא לא הולך למאסטרקלאס בגלל שיש לו שחייה באותו זמן. יש להם מאסטרקלאס במתמטיקה, והוא אמר שהוא לא הולך. לדעתי מאסטרקלאס זה כל כך כל כך שווה. אז? רייט. <laughs> right, so babies can do it. No pressure. <laughs> Does anyone have any, any suggestions? I'll write them here on the whiteboard. Does anyone want to suggest a word? We have one in the chat. But I'll... Excellent, yes? Yeah, right. Excellent. Oops. Right, you did hear Kosa. Do you remember who said it? Okay. That was my husband coming into the conversation in the middle. Um, why do you think you noticed it? Okay. Okay. Any other suggestion? Do you know which language it was in? Anyone else? So my husband speaks Spanish, and I suspect. <laughs> that people recognize this because it's Spanish, and it, it's probably a language you're more familiar with. And also it was a new, a new voice, so it sort of uh, set itself apart from the rest of the, uh, the rest of the speech. Okay, there was a hand there, yeah. Dermer? Yes. Okay. I'm writing this all in fake, um, you know, fake IPA, basically. I don't know what this is. This is actually fun because you hear things I don't hear and I hear things you don't hear. Phonetics and phonology have a very interesting interaction. So what we'll do is when we'll listen again, 
you'll, you'll raise your hand when we get to the part where you hear that, and we'll see what it is, how I hear it, basically. Anyone else? Yes. We've got loads of suggestions in the chat. Right, give um, me some I'll then. Give you, so one that I didn't hear, Rosemary said that said Family Guy. Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I don't know if that's there. Also, I'll give you two more. Fading. Fading, right. And laser. Excellent. Okay. Right. How do you spell laser? S or Z? S. S. Okay. I'm allowed to not know English spelling because it's not my uh, native language. Right, so Family Guy does not appear there, but we can listen again. And I'm not sure how to do it with a Zoom, actually. In a room, you can just raise your hand when we get to that bit. See if you can figure out what it, when it comes out. Okay. What about fading and laser do come up? Did other people hear fading and laser? No. Why do you think fading and laser uh, were, were noticed? by somebody. What's special about fading and laser and Hebrew? They're not Hebrew. They're not Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason people tend to hear words that they know from English is because they, they, you can recognize things in running speech if you are familiar with them from before. So one thing that makes things stand out is previous familiarity. That's true for babies, and it's true for adults. Yeah? I think I heard repetition of little words which I'm Yes, so it yes. Okay, the E is probably uh, some kind of a suffix, but we'll see. What about the lo? Did, that, <coughs> did other people catch the lo? Right. What do you think? Do, do people know what it means? Did you notice what it probably means by the intonation? Yes. What do you want me to say? Yeah. It means um, no. Yes. Uh, now, no. now, my daughter says, no! <laughs> so if you hear it, you know what it means. Why do you think you, you caught it? Why did it stand out for you? Right, so repetition makes things stand out. La something that is very long stands out. Something that is very loud stands out. All of these coalesce in this, in this one word. And also this um, very big intonational trajectory going from very high to very low makes things stand out. All these things help us segment words. They help babies segment words as well. So the same kinds of features that make things jump at you from this mush of speech. It must sound like a mush of speech to you. So what you hear is basically <laughs> and then I press stop and I ask it to give me answers. And it's a very, very difficult task to do. Um, I'll play it once more so that everyone can hear the fading and the laser and the law and the cosa. And these two are, you know, puzzles, so we'll find out what they are. Yeah. Can I add one more? Yes. Um, because loads of people in the chat have said masterclass. True. Which is, and they've said it's repeated a lot. Yes, it is. So, um, again, it's an English word or an English term, and it's familiar from before, so it stands out. Um, there is a, so one other thing you can, it's not, not part of this, but you can tell if this is a sort of a nice friendly conversation or a sort of more argument going on, what would you think we are having there? I'd call it an argument. <laughs> My son was invited to a master class. He doesn't want to go because he wants to go <coughs> swimming instead. And my daughter and I keep telling him, no, it's a really interesting thing to do. You should really go to a master class. That's the conversation. And you might have heard me shouting at my husband for a little bit, which is something I like to do as well. <laughs> right, so now we'll play it again. Ah, any other words you have there? Um, so someone actually noticed that the cosa might be Spanish. Or yeah. they might have heard the word Spanish. No, we didn't say Spanish, but they must have noticed the word. Yeah. Um, did someone put no? Yeah. Habib. And someone said half term. Half term is there as well. Okay. So you're, you're all hearing the English terms. Uh, Habib wasn't there, but it's, well, let's see. Now, OK. Sorry. I said Khosh. Khosh. No, but let's see where it is. <laughs> Sometimes 
you will see that people hear bits of words, usually the stressed bit of a word. So the stressed uh, syllables, because they are louder or longer or higher pitched, also stand out. And that's something that, so sometimes it's, a, it's a, like part of a word. So I, I don't recognize it when I hear it as, like this, but we'll try to recognize, recognize it in the running speech. So I'll play it one more time. And we'll see when we get to all these places. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Go back. Right. Did you hear the fading? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So my son is definitely code switching a lot, all kinds of lexical items he doesn't know in Hebrew he uses English terms for. And he's telling us about. Um, Planetarium, so there are lots of words that he doesn't know about planetariums in Hebrew. Sorry, did you hear the laser pointer? Right. I'm not very adept with this thing. Sorry. Did people hear master class? Um, I need you to wave it. It's already been? Oh, I didn't see you because I was trying to handle the play button. Hmm. Okay. So further back, let's go further back. <laughs> Before that? Oh. OK, I'll give it one more attempt, and otherwise I'll just give up. <laughs> Right. Is that what you heard as well? No. So you're, you heard, OK, that's really nice. So <laughs> he's saying, and then the light did fading, and we saw more and more and more stars. More and more and more is yoter yoter yoter. So he's saying, phonologically, he's saying yoter ve yoter ve yoter. And you heard uh, something like this, and combined. So the end of a sent, the end of one word with the beginning of the other word. And it's interesting, because Hebrew tends to put stress on the last syllable of words. So you started with, that's where the stress is. So you started with this stressed syllable, and then combined it with what came after, which is more like the stress pattern of English, where we have strong, weak words. And you also, um, I think, there is labiality in the V that you, so there might be issues of memory in addition to perception there. So you heard, the fact that you heard this is voiced probably has to do with the way voicing works in Hebrew and in English. Then you heard labiality here, the R from here or from here sort of merge with that syllable. So it just shows you that what you we are not listening to phonology. We're listening to phonetics, and they don't map to each other so neatly. But it, OK. Shall we? I'll just let you hear the law, because that's a lovely, lovely word, and then we'll stop and go on. Did you hear that? Right. So, this is a really difficult thing to do, right? Babies can do it, maybe. Not in our studies. There is another case study in the York Toolkit from a few years ago uh, where we described how we failed to get babies to segment uh, in Britain. But in the literature, the claim is that they do it all the time. It's very, very difficult to do. 
So in my field, there is an argument about where, what the source is of, the, of babies' first words. Where did they learn them? Where did they hear them? Did they hear them in uh, adult speech in isolation, which makes it easier to catch them, because there is a pause before and a pause after, and they're sort of nicely um, delineated in the speech? Or did they have to um, segment them out of running speech like you just did, which is very difficult to do? Now, there is a finding from 20-something years ago Brent and Siskind ran, this, ran a study, and they found that you can predict which words 15-month-old uh, toddlers will use uh, for measuring how often a word was said in isolation by their parents. So they actually measured parental speech, but not how often a word was said overall. So it's not general frequency that makes a word memorable for a child, but it's frequency in isolation. That paper came out a long time ago, and people know about it and they disregard it a lot. So many, many people are so wed to this idea that babies can segment and segment easily that they sort of forget that there is a finding that shows that babies maybe can segment, but they, their knowledge isn't really based on segmented words. And here are just two examples of quotes from the literature showing that people are, find it hard to believe that segmentation isn't something very, that happens a lot. So the first uh, quote is, even when mothers were explicitly encouraged to teach new words to their infants, words were presented in isolation only 28% of the time. Assuming that 28% is not enough, they put only before it, but whether it's enough or not is a question. And the other quote says, parents usually do not teach each isolated word one by one to their babies. Therefore, infants must have the ability to segment words from fluent speech for language acquisition. Now, the question whether babies do or don't learn from the, indeed, minority of words that are presented in isolation, we know that it is, it's a minority. This paper gives it a, tw a figure of 28%. Some other papers talk about even fewer, fewer such presentations, so something more like 10%. But the question whether babies learn from that or not is not a logical question or a question for intuition. It's an empirical question. We need to see what babies learn. And just like we don't use textbooks, look at the textbook and say, that's what children will learn out of this when they study with this textbook. We don't need exams. In, we, with school children, we examine the children to see what they learn. And with babies, we need to do the same. It's not enough to look at their textbook, you know, in the sense of what their parents say to them. So, what we're, what, it's important to measure input to children because that's, that's what they have, that's the material they have to learn from. And that teaches us a lot about what is available. But in addition, we need to test what the babies actually take from the input. So, testing their intake, what they actually learned. So, that's the study that I'm going to um, describe now. That's what we did in it. Um, and we designed a study to test whether babies learn more easily or more readily from words that, are, that they hear in isolation or words they hear in continuous, continuous speech or in sentences. We call that isol uh, in isolation or in sent sentential context. So we designed a book. It has pictures of animals with animal names that are rare, and we didn't expect the babies to know them. And we asked the families to read them to the babies for three weeks at home. So part of their book reading routine at home would now contain this book. Um, so we're now getting to the extension task. And here what we want to do is mostly think about methodology. So how do you create two conditions that are more or less um, comparable to each other? That's the, that's the task. Again, we'll do it here. Uh, in this session, and you also have a similar task in your materials um, to do with your students. So I'll show you two pages from our book, with the photos from two, from, of two animals, and I'll ask you in breakout rooms or in your tables here to come up with the text that you would put under those pictures for the book to send to the parents at home. One of the animals called it Dassey. We want the name Dassey to be in isolation. The other animal called a dugong, we want it to be in a sentence. And I'm not giving you any more in information than that. And people will do very different things. And none of these are wrong. Each of them has probably some advantages, some disadvantages 
We'll talk about them, and then I'll show you what we did. What we did isn't the right answer. It's just what we did, OK? So these are the pictures. And we can take, I don't know, three, four minutes for you in your groups to come up with text that would go with this, OK? And if you have questions, ask me. Bye. Are people more or less ready? Yeah? OK. So let's, let's hear your suggestions. We'll start with people in the room, and then Catherine, if you have someone in the chat, let us know. Does any table have the courage to tell us what they've come up with? Say, yeah, and on page two, what would you? Okay, so uh, just in case people in uh, in the Zoom didn't hear, the, the suggestion was that on the left hand side we just have the word dasi, and on the right hand side we'd have a sentence like dugong lives in the ocean. So. Um, we didn't go for that, but I'll tell you why. So one thing we were sort of worried about was having some pages be noisier than others. So just having more chatter around the words on the isolated pages than on the sentential pages. So we tried to have other words around the word in isolation, just make sure there are pauses there. We did consider what you've just suggested, but we didn't do it for that reason. Um, on, on the sentence, in the sentence, you put dugong at the beginning. And we act, so it is known that words are more easily segmented when they are at the edges of a sentence. So if they're at the beginning or at the end, <coughs> at least you have one border clearly, you know, defined for you. So that was what we went for as well. We put them at the end rather than at the beginning, but it, we could have done the other uh, just as well. So. What you did with the sentence was very similar to what we did, but we didn't go for the word in isolation on the left-hand side. So did any other group do anything different on the isolated page, for instance? Did everyone put the word just in isolation? Anyone in the chat did anything different? Um, they've said, so Tracy has said, just label the DASI, so that's in isolation. Yeah. And then, but say, the dugong swims, which I think so, right, so English, unfortunately, mostly requires an, an article before the noun. You said, I think, dugong without the the. Um, and if I'd put dugong at the beginning, I would have gone for dugong without the the preceding it, because then the the adds a little bit of maybe additional segmentational difficulty at the beginning. But because of that, we put dugong at the end, because then it wasn't an issue. Um, Nobody else did anything different for the uh, isolated. Yes. I, I, I suggested something like this is a Nazi because this is uh, would be something that they heard all the time. Right. So that they might, if they are doing this, be looking for that. Okay. So this is a Dasi. Wouldn't put Dasi in isolation. What we did is very very similar. We said something like this is an animal. Dasi. So I'll show you how we did it. Um, the other thing is we were ro rotating the words between the sentences. So we wanted to make sure that all the, all the words, there was nothing special about one, li one list of animal names. So some kids heard, say, list A in isolation. Some kids heard it in a, in a sentence. And some kids didn't hear it at all in the book. And so we avoided making the sentences informative in any way. So it was, there was no ocean, no nothing. It was very, very banal sentences that we used, more like the this is a type of sentence. Um, so I'll show you now. And actually, we weren't expecting the kids to learn about these animals or to understand much. It was, again, about word forms, just like the exercise you were just doing. So these are this is the text we used. We had very banal sentences, as I've just said. So look at this lovely pet, Dasi, versus look at this lovely dugong. Um, we made sure that there were the same number of syllables overall on the isolated pages and on the sentential pages in the book. So here we are, there is one more syllable in the isolated uh, example. But in general, we made sure that there was the same. So this is the chatter uh, issue. So we didn't want 
one, one word to be really said in complete science, silence and the other word to be part of more speech. And we didn't tell the parents anything about how to read the books, but we hoped that because we had a full stop and the word was on the next row, next line, parents would make a pause before it. But they weren't told to do it, and we didn't record them, and we don't really know how they read the book. That was the kind of sentences we had there. And as I said, again, we rotated the words. So for a third of the children got different books. For a third of the books, the word Dasi would have been in isolation. For a third of them, it would have been in a sentence. And a third of them didn't have the word Dasi in them at all. OK? So after the parents read the books to their children for three weeks, we brought the babies to the lab to test what they actually remembered from the book. And we used what is called the head turn preference procedure. And I'll show you what it looks like. So we run it in our lab. This is inside the room in our lab. There is a sound attenuated room inside it. So the babies don't hear other uh, sounds from outside and are not distracted. The parent uh, or caregiver sits on this chair with a child on their lap. And they're facing a three-sided booth with dark black walls, barely, basically so that there won't be any visual uh, distractions either. I hope you can see what's going on here. So here is the chair where the baby would be sitting. Opposite them, there is a hole with a video camera filming what they're doing. Underneath the video camera, there is a little light that we flash to get the, the baby to look to the front. And once they've looked to the front, we have a light either on the right or on the left flashing. And when they look to the flashing light, some sound starts to play from that side of the, of the room. And if they are attending to the sound, they look to the source of the sound, although there is nothing really to look at. So attention is signaled here by looking in the direction of the sound, which is a little bit odd, but it works. Um, and so we play different, usually two contrasting things to them from the different sides. We swap sides and so on. And we measure how long they look to the two kinds of things. And if they pay more attention to one thing than the other, we can basically conclude that they could tell the difference between the two things. If they listen to the same amount of time to the two things, we don't know if they've noticed the difference. But if they prefer to listen to one than the other, we think they could tell the difference between them. In this case, every child was tested on words they heard in the book and word that they didn't, words they didn't hear in the book. If they showed a different amount of interest in one kind over the other, that tells us that they probably recognize the words from the book. That's all we wanted to hear, to know here. And this is the kind of thing that they heard. Bongo, Condor, Dunlin, Fennec, Gibbon, Poodoo, Zebra, Beaver. So they heard a list of animal names like that. Some kids would hear this list, and this, these would be the words they heard in isolation in the book. For some kids, these would be the words they heard in a sentence in the book. And for some kids, these would be words they've never heard before. First time they hear them, they are in the lab. Okay? And then that is contrasted with another list. There is an experimenter sitting outside looking at the screen, which shows the footage from the baby basically looking to the right or the left. And the experimenter presses a button to indicate if the baby is looking to the right or the left, and the computer calculates how long they've been looking. And this is usually not a lion, but a baby. <laughs> right. So here are the results from this first study. We have um, on the left-hand side, whoops, here, the average looking time in milliseconds. Babies, the lists go on for, I don't know, 12 seconds or something, but the babies tend to lose interest pretty quickly. So we have looking times around six seconds or so. Um, and these, the panel on the right, sorry, panel, no, 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 here. Panel on the, sorry, on the left uh, um, represents the behavior of the kids who came to the lab and were listening to words they heard in isolation from the book or words they've never heard before. And the panel on the right are the kids who came to the lab and listened to the words they heard in sentences in the book or words they haven't heard before. And what we're looking for is a difference in the looking time between looking to the words from the book and the words you've never heard before. So can someone tell me which group seems to be recognizing the words from the book based on the fact that they're looking differently to the words they've heard before and the words they didn't? 
Was that a finger? Yes. The isolated words. Yes. A mark difference from the yes. Yeah. So the group who is being tested on the words that were, appeared in isolation in the book, they're showing, they're looking longer to the words here in, in this um, red bar. They're looking longer to the words that were presented in isolation uh, in the book when they're hearing them in this task than to the words they've never heard before in blue. The other group looks even. They, they don't recognize the words, right? Now, what's missing here? What did we not do? Or how did we bias our test in some, in some way? So people who really believe in segmentation saw this and said, ha. Why did they say ha? <laughs> They said, well, clearly, you're testing words in isolation with words in isolation. If you tested the words in the, in the lab using seg a segmentation task, if you'd given the, the children passages to segment words out of, they would do better with the words that they had, they had to segment from the book. So we ran that study as well. Um, so if in experiment one, you've just heard we played lists, this was what we played in experiment two. One summer's day, the poodle and the fennec went for a stroll. They saw a tiny zebra and a smiley beaver playing golf. Along came a condor with a gibbon to join in the game. And of course, there was a dunlin too. Then a bongo called them all in for their brunch. Now, as you notice, these are not the sentences from the book. But if kids are good at segmentation, they're good at segmentation. So they would segment the words from the book and then segment them again in the task, in the test. So they came, we had a new bunch of babies come to the lab, again, tested each, either with the words in, uh, they heard in isolation in the book against words they didn't hear before on the left, or words here, this panel, or words that they heard in a sentence in the book against words they didn't hear before in the lab. Uh, again, we have the here, listening times here on the left. Can anyone tell me if any of the groups is looking like they can recognize the words? No. So nobody could do this one. This is too difficult. They can't, if segmentation once is difficult, segmentation twice is difficult as well, if not more difficult. So basically, basically here we got null results. None of the babies showed any recognition, neither for the words in, in sentences from the book nor for the words in isolation. So our conclusion is that words in isolation are much easier to learn and to remember. And we're looking here at you know, long-term memory. So these are, they heard the words in home, at home, came to the lab after a few weeks, recognized only the words they hear in isolation, but only when they were tested in isolation as well. So segmenting, it, or words in isolation are easier to um, catch and, and remember long term, but also they're just easier on the spot. When you're talking about an online kind of task, they're easier then. And when you make them segment in, a, in the moment, that is very difficult. So um, we're, that was run and published in 2019. After that, we decided we're going to look not at a situation where we uh, control for the words heard um, so, you know, having the frequency of the words in isolation and in, se in sentences be the same, we said, let's look at what speech babies are actually hearing in their daily lives and see which are the words that they tend to recognize earlier. Do they recognize the words that they would hear a, lo uh, a lot in isolation or recognize the words they hear a lot overall? That would be a mirroring of the study that I showed you right at the beginning of the Brenton Siskin study from the early 2000s that nobody um, is paying attention to, they tested how you predict the first uh, words that um, children know at 15 months, but which words baby, uh, children at 15 months actually say. And we wanted to see if the same is true for the words that they, st word forms that they recognize before they start to talk. So we're testing kids at 11 months. So we had recordings from something like nearly 80 families um, speaking at home. And we looked at the frequencies of the words. And we discovered that the words that are highest in frequency in isolation are unfortunately also highest in frequency in running speech. So it's not, you can't actually test it that cleanly. 
But the words that are frequent in isolation are few, and the words that are frequent in running speech are very, very numerous. So we ended up coming up with a list of the highest frequency words in isolation versus the almost highest frequency words in running speech, and, try and comparing uh, wh which of these two lists the babies would recognize in the lab. Um, we started running it with uh, both lists and passages, just like we did here. But with the passages, to avoid getting people telling us, oh, yeah, yeah, but they didn't manage to do it because you recorded the speech too fast, and it's not like the speech they hear normally, blah, blah, blah. We just took a speech from a mother from one of the recordings we had of these families. So we let babies listen to the kind of speech that a real mother speaks to a real baby in real daily life. And then COVID came and ruined everything, so we have no results. <laughs> um, but we're hoping to have results. Well, we're hoping to start rerunning it, Catherine and me, next year, hopefully. So that's, uh, you know, this is an unknown, uh, no, I can't say anything more about this for now. Finally, do I have two more minutes? Yeah. So the question is, what is all this good for? Why are we bothering asking these questions? My first answer is because it's interesting, but <laughs> in addition is, that, you know, we can think, is there any practical use we can make of this kind of a finding? So I'm opening it up to you, and I'll tell you what we thought maybe it can do. But I don't know if anyone here has an idea. That'll be nice. So one thing is to say maybe what is true for babies is true for older children in, you know, or for children with language uh, disorders. I think it's more sort of for new parents, kind of to promote. This. Ah, okay, to promote. Not to assume it's instinctive to do that isolation. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is one thing that I sort of toyed with, and I sort. Of, my feeling is that telling parents that what they do can be improved is the most stressful thing you can do to a parent, <laughs> and I wouldn't like to do it to them unless really necessary. So we thought about it, you know, should we make it into advice for parents, and I thought, that's terrible. They do it anyway, even if they do it just 10% of the time, it's good that, enough. But the project, I'm thinking more sort of like the Sure Start Centers, yeah. Boston, kind of that idea of yeah. so that, that there is a parenting way it could benefit Support. So maybe that that I mean so again because what we're saying what we're finding is that although there isn't much there there isn't there aren't many isolated words in parent speech what there is is important and stands out enough I would tell sure start tell parents to talk to their children but don't tell them how to talk to their children because if you have to think about what you're doing it won't yeah. work yeah I think that probably would work. I mean, this study isn't enough to base advice to teachers of, of other languages on, because you need to test it with older children. But I'm now trying to learn Arabic, and I keep telling the people who talk to me, speak slower, and that's actually what I'm, I want them to put some pauses between the words, and they don't actually. But the, yeah, I think it would be helpful for learning other languages. Yeah? Speech therapy, I was just thinking speech therapy. Yeah. Where, where you're actually working with. So the area in speech therapy which was suggested to us, but again, it all sort of died a death at some point. We never actually continued. Was um, someone who was working with uh, deaf children with cochlear implants, and she said, the kids get implanted towards the end of the first year, and then by the time it gets activated, there is quite a lot of time. They, are, they start hearing um, quite late, and the parents are usually advised to speak as they would to a child of that age who is uh, typically hearing. And the speech and language therapist said, having heard this talk, now I'm thinking maybe we should give different advice. And in this kind of situation, maybe that makes sense, to talk to babies who are Children who are just starting to hear language, maybe 
go slow on very long sentences and try to shorten them or try to use a lot of isolated words. That makes sense to me. But as I said, it never sort of, we, it never, we never turned it. This should lead to another study, really, and we never got there. So that's the end of my talk. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you.